Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In January 2004, a 60 ton sperm whale died, it was beached on the southwest coast of Taiwan. Two weeks later, the authorities decided to truck this dead whale to a laboratory. The idea was that they wanted to do an autopsy. It took 50 men and three cranes 13 hours to get this 60-ton whale onto a flatbed semi. It was quite the spectacle. People poured out from all over the sides of the country and the streets to watch this spectacle of this 60-ton whale being driven through downtown. And then it happened. The whale exploded. Boom! Icker and gore everywhere. It blew up. This, this truck is crawling through the cities and people are, are crouching to get close to see this spectacle and the whale just popped. Now this, is, this technically is not unusual. You see, whales have very large in, internal organs and I don't know if you've ever noticed, but whales are airtight. <laughs> They're watertight. And they have really tough skins, which means that the animal will putrefy on the inside far longer than it will to take the outside to decay. So the the internal organs liquefy and putrefy, and then all of a sudden, boom, exploding whales. Now normally, Normally, this happens in a kind of demure way. Usually, the the animal will, after a certain amount of pressure builds up, they will lose some of that that pressure through its mouth or its blowhole or other assorted holes that whales might have. Karen told me that was the only word I was allowed to use, but it would they would sort of seep right, instead of explode. But if you take 13 or 50 men and three cranes and damage the skin and put them up on a flatbed trailer, you damage the skin and all of a sudden, exploding whales. And sometimes life's like that. (laughs) You just, you don't know what you're getting into until it's too late and all of a sudden, things have gone wrong, maybe even horribly wrong. You're just going about your business and boom, exploding whales. And maybe it's not a whale. Maybe it's something significantly messier, like the end of a relationship or a premature death or a stock crash or a child's death or a layoff or the Russians invade. Today we continue our sermon series on witnesses to Christ. Today we go to John chapter 18 and meet Malchus. Malchus is an interesting cat. He's really, for the most part, he's just going about his business. He's just doing what he's told. He's a servant. He is not his own man. He's going about his all his business all by himself, doing what he's supposed to be doing, and all of a sudden a whale explodes. All of a sudden, he's just doing his job, and all of a sudden, he's got this crazy fisherman with a sword trying to lop his head off. John 18, Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples, and Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some of the officials of the chief priests and the Pharisees, went out with lanterns and torches and weapons. It's quite a band he's got there. He's got Roman soldiers, a crowd of Roman soldiers who who control the the Roman government, officials of the chief priests, the chief priests who control the temple, and and some of the Pharisees who control sort of the religion of Israel. It's, It's like the Supreme Court and the Congress send the FBI out to arrest Jesus. And who's leading them but Judas? And what's Judas up to? Betrayal. And betrayal leads to chaos. 
John chapter 18, verse 10, Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, and he struck the high priest's servants and cut his right ear clean off. All four of the Gospels talk about Peter with the sword, but it's John who tells us who the servant's name is, Malchus. I'm sure Peter was trying to do much more than just cut off his ear. It's a problem with, with fishermen turning into murderers. I guess it kind of takes a little bit of practice. I'm sure he was swinging and trying to do a lot more damage. In my mind, I see Malchus doing this. Did you just come out with a sword? Where's my ear? He's just minding his own business there. He's doing what he's supposed to, and the whale explodes. You ever had a, a sudden mess in your life? And it's just boom. Everything is fine, and then it goes boom, and you're doing everything in your power just to survive. Your mind run on a thousand miles an hour. Have you consulted the bank? Did you change your diet? Called the attorney? Tightened your budget? Gone to counseling? Been arrested? Invaded by Russians? Lost a home to fire or flood? Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't ever give up. Because control is clear. Who's in control? Who is, who is really, when it's all said and done, who is really in charge of our lives? Is it you? Not really. Well, I'm sure you can decide on what you're going to have for dinner. You can decide where you're going to live to a certain extent, what kind of a job you're going to do. Judas and the Jews and the Romans appeared to they think that they were running everything. And I say appeared because it appeared. Christ is really in control. As we talked about on Sunday, Jesus is giving up. He is giving himself up. He is giving himself over to the will of God the Father. And it's he who is in control, not the Romans, not the Pharisees, not the Sadducees, not the priests, certainly not Judas. Not even Malchus. Control is clear. When, when his enemies come, Jesus goes out to meet them. Judas approaches. He doesn't run from them. Peter strikes at Malchus. Christ commands Peter to put away his sword. Listen to what Jesus says. No one takes my life. I lay it down of my own accord. Though the powers of darkness rise against him full throttle, Christ is in control. This entire, this entire life of Jesus has been according to, to his plan, not theirs. Matthew tells us at this point, Jesus mentions that he could have called down for himself 12 legions of angels. A legion in the Roman Empire was 6,000 soldiers. You do the math, because I can't, because that's why I talk for a living. Math is hard. 12 times 6,000 is 72, I wrote it down, 72,000 angels. Jesus doesn't need 72,000 angels. You don't need 72,000 angels to give up. You don't need 72,000 angels to give over. You don't need 72,000 angels when you were in charge all along. During World War II, psychologists compared ground troops to fighter pilots to see which ones had better mental health. I just love when psychologists uh, study things, and you're like, seriously? You had to study that. They determined that after 60 days of continuous combat, the anxiety of the ground troops was off the chart. After 60 days, an astounding 73% of fighter pilots were pretty happy and well-adjusted and pretty happy with the way the war was going. And they had to figure out what, what was the difference, what was the problem. Well, to, to a certain extent, the fighter pilots have a great deal of control over their life. When they get in the plane, it's them. It's them against them. They've got the stick. They've got their hands on the throttle. Everything depends on what they're doing. The ground troops have hardly any control over anything. They can be shot just as easily going uphill or downhill or not doing anything at all. That lack of control breeds anxiety. Popular wisdom tells us to always seek control. Popular wisdom always tells us you've got to be in control. A team of German researchers recently found that tra traffic jams triples your chances of a heart attack. Why do we study these things? I could have told you that. 
You sit in a, in a traffic jam with me or my wife at any point, you will see it. You're like you're going to die, especially me. I don't do the traffic jams very well. I would just assume get off the road, go all the way around a state, than to sit in a traffic jam. At least I'm moving. I may be moving in the wrong direction, but at least I'm moving. I'm fine with that. Popular wisdom tells us to always seek control. So what's the plan when the whale explodes? Popular wisdom will tell us to try to regain control. Never board a plane without a parachute. Never leave the house without a gas mask. Don't ever step on a crack because you will break your mother's back. We've known that. That It's a known thing. Face every exploding whale by taking control. The only problem is we can't. We can't. You can't control everything. You can barely control anything. You can't even control the hairs on your head. Rather than seek control, maybe we should try something else. Maybe relinquish control. Take a page out of Jesus' book and give up. To relinquish ourselves unto the plans of the Lord God Almighty, resign as CEO of the universe, and give our entire mess, that's a reference to the whale again, over to Jesus. His calm is contagious. This was all to fulfill the word that had been spoken. To those of whom you gave me, I'm not lost but one. Not one. I misquoted that there. Christ is calm because he trusts scriptures, and Christ's calm is contagious. Put away your sword. Put away your control. Put away your vision for the way you saw this going down. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Christ is in control. He's in control of your life. He's in control of your world. He's in control of your sin, and he has pulled it away. He has taken it away from you. It is no longer there. Your guilt has been replaced with innocence. John chapter 4, verse 14, 14, whoever drinks the water that I will give unto him will never be thirsty again. Christ is in control of our aching thirst and he quenches it with an unquenchable love. John 18 or 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. Christ is in control of the darkness. He is the light of the world. When parents send their kids to camp, they have to sign a form. It's funny, I get a piece of paper and they get a kid. We have to sign a form. And the form basically says, who is responsible? Who is the responsible party for this child? If little Johnny breaks his arm, who do I call? If little Malik catches measles, who do I call? So the parent signs his or her name, puts grandma's phone number on there. Christ is in control of our lives. He wrote it in his own blood, baptized us for the forgiveness of our sins and a guarantee of our resurrection from the dead. Our eternal life is sealed in that baptismal water. Jesus took full responsibility for us. And when the whale explodes, Jesus is the responsible party, not you. It is his job to see us through the disaster. It is his job to see us through the unforeseen. It is his job to see us through this mess. There's one thing true about our lives. We are either heading for a mess, we're in a mess, or we just got through a mess. Where are you? And no matter what happens, you do not have to become hopeless, you do not have to become anxious, you do not have to be faithless stay calm because even in the face of uncertainty christ is in control god is in control 
When the whale explodes, Jesus delivers perfect peace. He reaches out his hand to heal and to reassure that we are his people and he is our God. And he can bring healing. Don't believe me? Ask Malchus, who experienced the healing of God firsthand. In Jesus' name, amen.